Are you having confidence issues in the bedroom because you're struggling with maintaining a long lasting erection for your partner? Try Blue Chew, an online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code HOLLY to receive your first month for free. Hey guys, welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsor, Care of Vitamins. It is a subscription service that ships high quality, personalized vitamins curated just for you and your needs straight to your door. I take my Care of Vitamins every single day. I have for years and I have to tell you, it makes a huge difference in how I feel every day. Um, You can get 50% off of your first care of order by going to takecareof.com and entering code holly50. Okay. So you first met my guest on my podcast back in 2019 when she was only a year into her adult career. She's now appeared in over 500 scenes as a multi ABN and XBiz award winner and has recently released her directorial debut stars through adult time. This movie is based on her personal experience carving her own path into the adult industry after being manipulated by an older man. Let's welcome Jane Wilde. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me back. Of course. It's so good to see you again. I know. It's been forever, I feel like. It has. The last time I saw you was when I shot you for Bombshell of the Month. I know. And I love those photos. Yeah. They came out really cool. So good. So um, what's what's been going? on in these last three years a lot well um we had a global pandemic did we yeah did we i think it might have been about almost three years ago i don't remember that (laughs) and it's crazy um that you know when we did our interview in 2019 like we couldn't have and nobody in the world i think could have understood or or realized like how much the world was going to change in such a short amount of time Um, but we adapted. So I, for the past few years, I've just been adapting and kind of just figuring out like, what does life look like now? What does my career look like? What does my future look like? Um, so it's been a lot of like introspection and just continuing to grind away at adult work and then pursuing like several new endeavors. Mm -hmm. So it's been good. It's been interesting because I know the pandemic was like, horrible for a lot of people. And, um, but I find that it was actually really good for sex workers in a lot of ways. What was your experience like? Um, well, obviously at first when the lockdown happened, that was not good for anybody because we were just like so unsure of what was going to happen. We had no idea. Um, a lot of uncertainty as far as are we going to be able to work with other people again? Cause like, that's what we do. That's Mm -hmm. part of life. Um, then once we were able to come back to work in mainstream and kind of start collaborating again, um, that was really good. But the explosion of OnlyFans and just like, um, private subscription platforms or just like personal content in general. Um, at first I was like a little scared about it because majority of the stuff that I did was like, you know, company mainstream scenes. And I wasn't really putting that much thought or effort into my OnlyFans or into the future, what I could make from that, like make of myself. And then I finally started taking it seriously, like right around two years ago at this time. And it's just been a blessing. Like, I don't know if I would have made it through the pandemic um, mentally or like financially without my subscribers. So just realizing the potential of that and the potential of like, the future that as long as I have my subs and my loyal fans, like I can do anything I want to do. And it doesn't just have to stay like in the adult world. Yeah. So that's been really enlightening to realize. So how has the pandemic affected like how you see work now? Um, how I see work? Well, being in the adult industry, work has always been kind of subjective because I've always just 
loved it so much um, that I didn't really see it as work. And that could also just be me being like a 20 year old and only having had one real job before. And then I'm thrown into this world and I'm able to make a lot of money and connections and networking just by doing something I love, which is having sex and performing and entertaining people. Um, So I never saw it as work, but then with the pandemic and, you know, now putting this work into OnlyFans, creating my own content, I definitely see it more as like a job and not just like, oh, something I get to do for fun and like, oh, and I get paid. But I'm really starting to think about like marketing and just the different aspects that go into running a business. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to see it more as like running a business as Mm -hmm. opposed to just going to work, if that makes sense. Are you feeling like more longevity? Yeah. Yeah. Like the the longevity is, um, feels more attainable as opposed to in the past, like unless you were like the most iconic porn star and like, you know, going on Howard Stern and celebrities knowing who you are, like you leave the industry and then you kind of just have to, unless you saved all your money, you have to just go back to a normal life. But I feel that those days are kind of over and that if you want to continue your career and your longevity, you can, as long as you're willing to put the work into it. So do you feel more secure financially and secure in your career? Yes, definitely. Um, This year is probably, since I started um, doing adult films, probably the least amount of scenes that I've shot, Um, just still a good amount. I've been working, but the least out of all the years. And I'm not upset about that. I'm not panicked. I'm not scared for my future because I know that no matter what, um, the loyal fans I've accumulated are going to stick around as long as I keep feeding them more Mm -hmm. content. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, so we talked, you talked about marketing. I know you started a YouTube channel. So tell me about your inspiration behind that. So, um, I would say my inspiration behind it was just seeing, um, how, I don't want to say like sex obsessed, but like how interested people really are in the lives of adult performers. And, you know, some people might act like they're not and who wants to see this shit or who wants to hear about that. But secretly, they're also the ones clicking on the video when I say like, here's, you know, a day in the life of a porn star or this is, you know, how I prepare for a scene or this is how I would pursue getting in the adult industry. And um, I think there's, I just had this longing, like I want to create a new type of content. I don't want to stop making adult content, but I also want to make content that's consumable by people that don't just want to watch porn. Like, Mm -hmm. so I feel that I have more to say and more to offer than just my porn scenes. So I said, YouTube, I've been using YouTube since I was a child, like a little girl, and now I'm an adult. And I feel that I have a lot to say. Mm-hmm. So I thought YouTube would be a really good platform um, for getting that out there. And it has been. Yeah. So what were some of the first videos you put up on YouTube and, and what was the response and were you surprised by that response? So the first video I put on my channel was a story time video where I talked about an incident that I had on set <laughs> um, involving a banana going somewhere that a banana would not normally go. Mm. And then there were some serious consequences from that situation. Um, And it's funny because- Oh, food porn. Yes, food porn, (laughs) literally. And when that incident was going down, which happened back in February, I remember thinking distinctly, I hadn't posted anything on my YouTube yet, but I had made the account and told people to subscribe. I remember thinking, wow, this is going to be such a funny story to tell in a YouTube video. Um, That's not why I did it. (laughs) It just (laughs) happened that way. Um, So I told the story and I posted some pictures. And I don't know if it's just a thing like whenever people visit your channel, they always want to go see what the first video is. But that's definitely my best performing video on YouTube. Um, Also, I think just the absurdity of the situation. Yeah. People were like thinking it's kind of funny. Um, But yeah, people, they really liked it. So I've done a couple other like story time telling weird stuff that's happened. And and just I want to keep it fun. You know, Mm -hmm. at first I was posting um, kind of like some serious videos talking about real kind of some dark stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, But I deleted those videos because 
I just realized that there's a lot of stuff that I put out there that I don't necessarily want to stay out there. Mm. Like, I'm not ashamed or regretful of putting it out there. Like, if you saw it and you know it now, that's fine. But a lot of that stuff is, like, very personal stuff, I realize, and stuff I'm still working through. Mm -hmm. So I don't um, want it to be content, at least not right now. Mm -hmm. It's still, like, needs to be worked on so i understand it's kind of like because the problem is too with the youtube algorithm is that if something becomes popular youtube pushes it out more and more and more and more Mm -hmm. and then people who may not know you or know your channel that's like the only video that they ever see from you and then it gives people a specific idea about the industry and i know that like you went you talked about some some stuff that you dealt with during the pandemic with Mm -hmm. like I, I wouldn't even say like inappropriate like producers and directors, but mm-hmm. just like, you know, like some some pretty serious things that you went through and yes. other women too, you know. And that was an interesting thing too about the pandemic was like we kind of, which I thought was a good thing. We had Great. this kind of like second wave Me Too yeah. movement because, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed to me that now, you know, first of all, COVID and being in lockdown gives you a lot of time with yourself to like Mm -hmm. think about shit. Right. Um, so you can't really escape your mind as you could if you're going to work all the time. And then, um, the financial independence that people started to feel with like OnlyFans, that fear of being blacklisted for speaking Mm -hmm. out against things that happen to you. I, I feel like people were like, actually, I can talk about these things because like, there's not this fear of, of losing all this work and being blacklisted. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, other people started to come in and and basically corroborate other people's stories. And so yes. I thought it was good because I felt like some bad people got kind of pushed out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know I will tell you, like, specifically, I know that <laughs> there was like a culling of the herd at MindGeek. I know that they like called a lot of models and agents and were like, these like tell us about our directors like have you had problems with any of these and some mm-hmm. stories came up about certain people that they weren't aware of and those people got axed yeah um i was like so relieved you're great that I, I was like i'm good but you still think back and you still examine you're like wait did i ever do anything that someone could misconstrue but no yeah i mean i'm um yeah i mean i think also as a woman and like that i don't like women and i've never tried to ever have sex with anybody that I've ever been with. But I, you know, I definitely thought, and then that's actually when we started talking about bringing the boundary checklist in because it didn't exist before that. We'd have like a quick conversation about what we were doing, but there was never like that really explicit, like, is this okay? Is this okay? Is Mm -hmm. this okay? So I felt like it was really good because it, um, kind of forced me as a producer to like really check in with everyone and make sure that like we're all on the same page. Cause sometimes, you, you read people wrong or mm-hmm. you think somebody's okay with something and they're not and right. they don't feel comfortable speaking up. So When it comes to something as serious as consent mm-hmm. in a sexual situation, I think that there's no room for error. You know, mm-hmm. there's no margin for error. There's no room to like read it and try to figure like nobody should have to figure out what's going on everybody should know exactly what's expected and exactly what's going on at all times and if there's any confusion it it should be cleared up immediately um and it kind of sucks that you know it took all of that to make that happen but i do feel very happy that that's the case for multiple big companies right now um holding everybody on set accountable including the talent themselves to make their boundaries clear because like you can't you can't um control violating someone's boundaries if you don't know what the boundaries are like mm-hmm. if you don't have that knowledge how are you supposed to know what is okay and what isn't like obviously you know there's certain things that are never okay mm-hmm. if someone says stop you of course you stop um but there are, you know there's certain things that in a couple of years before this happened we're getting more normalized. I think rougher behavior on set and just um, kind of an expectation that a female talent will be like down for whatever. And that's Mm -hmm. just not the case. And it never needs to be the case. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think what you said about the fear of blacklisting was so true and not even just in a financial aspect, but in a social aspect. Um, I've seen it with my own eyes, like people who make accusations that 
for whatever reason, the majority doesn't believe, they do get ostracized from their community. And especially as sex workers and sex work adjacent people, um, we're already so marginalized by society. And then to be experiencing that from your own community, um, it just, it, it shouldn't be happening. I, I hate the fact that it has happened um, and hopefully it will not be happening again because now, yeah, I like the fact that everyone was able to come together in droves basically and just look when 10 women are all saying the exact same thing about one person it's I mean where there's smoke there's fire yeah there is and I think the people that try so hard to uh, defend those types of people or they're always on the side of the accused person they're never stopping to think wait let me think logically for a second and think about why would 10 women that don't know each other we're in the industry but none of us know each other why would we conspire because that's basically what you're saying it's a conspiracy that we all came together and decided we're going to ruin the life and accuse this one person that did nothing wrong right. and we're all just going to say these things for no reason and risk the blacklisting that doesn't happen yeah that i think people think that happens way more often than it actually does mm-hmm. and that is like the rarity the most common scenario is that this person had bad behavior Mm -hmm. and got a little too entitled and had too much power and felt like they were God and they could get away with anything and treating young women, however, and you just can't do that anymore. So I feel very lucky to have witnessed that radical change because it needed to happen. And if COVID needed to happen for people to be like, well, you know, I don't need to worry about if I'm going to accuse this person and then possibly see like their best friend on set, you know, mm-hmm. on Monday, that wasn't the case during COVID. We all were stuck at home. So it's almost like that freedom. It's like, there's no expectation of me. Who knows if we're even going to get to go back to work yeah. at that time? We didn't even know. Yeah. So it's like, what the fuck do we have to lose? Nothing. So yeah. We just went for it. Yeah. And I think also, too, the one mistake that people tend to make is like, oh, well, I never saw this person behave that way. That doesn't mean that they didn't because like people act differently with different people. Yes. And so. some abusers or people who engage in that type of behavior regularly, they're very strategic. And yeah. obviously their whole goal is to not get caught. So whatever steps they need to take to not get caught, which might involve, you know, being selective with who they behave that way around or, you know, having like a special relationship with someone and making them feel special. Um, There's a lot of tactics that these types of people use. I have experienced that firsthand. Um, So I'm just glad that people like that are being called out. And, and, you know, obviously, thank you to the brave people that were the first whistleblowers on, on any type of dark situation like that. So do you do you find that the set culture is different now that you've come back to work after COVID? Yes, definitely. Um, I don't want to say, I mean, when I was brand, brand new, there were definitely instances when I felt uncomfortable on set and didn't feel comfortable speaking up or saying anything. For whatever reason, maybe I felt like, you know, the people on set, they're all kind of like a family and they have camaraderie and I'm the outsider coming in and I'm going to get penalized for not being comfortable or whatever the case is. It's definitely the power is in the talent's hands now. I think, um, again, with the content and OnlyFans and now us having the opportunity and the power to walk away from these sets and these companies and say, if I don't ever want to do another scene, I don't have to and I will be fine. There's a freedom and a power that comes with that. And I I think that, you know, the heads of the companies have kind of seen that and noticed that. So we're definitely there's an incentive to come back to set and come back to work with companies because of the treatment and the experience has gotten better. Yeah. No, I I mean, as a producer, I definitely feel that like there was a time before where, you know, if I had a situation where a model like didn't feel like she could finish the scene for whatever reason. She's in pain. She's not feeling well. Um, whatnot. Like if I called the scene that I would just hear, never hear the end of it from my client and I would have Mm -hmm. to pay my out of my own pocket to reschedule it and reshoot it. Um, 
And I will say, I mean, I only work for Mind Geek now. I'm not shooting for anybody else, but they've made it like quite clear that that's not the case. So mm -hmm. I feel better too about the environments that, you know, I'm putting people in. I mean, I like, I like to believe that I've always like had a safe set where people feel comfortable and feel okay to speak up. But, you know, I don't know that for sure. Um, but I do feel better like now as a producer, I feel that. It's just everybody feels more comfortable. And I like the boundary checklist thing. I think that's really good. Yeah, I like it too because um, it just holds everybody accountable to not do anything that someone's not okay with. And it just because, you know, we're in porn, um, we're doing adult work, that a lot of people might look down on that. It doesn't mean that we should look down on ourselves and feel like we don't deserve good treatment on set or just because it's not a Hollywood movie set that we don't deserve to have our voices heard or, or to not do something that makes us uncomfortable or to feel this pressure. Like if I don't do something that makes me uncomfortable, nobody on set, including my friends and the crew and everything, no one's going to get paid. Mm -hmm. Nobody should feel that type of pressure and feel inclined to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. That's, in a way that's coercion and that yeah. shouldn't be happening on adult sets because people have a lot of weird ideas about what goes down in this industry and they think that coercion happens a lot more than it does. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that I have rarely, if ever, experienced it. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the changes that were made during COVID. That yeah. Nobody feels like oh, well, you know, we want to do the best scene possible. So if you could like do this position and then do that. And it, if, if you don't want to do it, you shouldn't have to do it. Like it shouldn't be, there's a freedom that comes with this type of work where you shouldn't have to do anything you don't want to do. It's your consent. It's your body. That's your privilege. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back. We're of course going to talk about Jane's movie stars. So Hang tight. We'll be right back. Guys, it's all about confidence when it's time for sex. Am I right? And what's a better confidence booster than a fun round or two with your partner, all courtesy of the chewables from bluechew.com. Now you may ask, what's Blue Chew? Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and they prepare and ship direct, so it's cheaper than a pharmacy. And the bonus is you can do all of this from the privacy of your own home. Your physician consult is online, so you never have to visit a doctor's office or a pharmacy. Right now, they are offering a special deal for my listeners. Try Blue Chew for free, yes, free, when you use my promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code HOLLY, to receive your first month for free. Okay, guys, we are back. So, Jane, tell us about the synopsis of your adult time movie stars. So, the synopsis, I guess you could say, without giving anything away of what occurs, it's about a young woman, an 18-year-old young woman that experiences her 18th year of life and during that year um she's being trafficked by a pimp so that is something that happened to me in my life um and it's really it's it's kind of non-linear in the sense that I didn't want it to be like okay and then this happens and then the week after this happens because that's not how it went there was obviously in a year there's a lot of times when things are just average or normal or my version of what normal was at that time. But there were certain memories that have stood out to me since it's been about six years now um, since the situation began. And I wanted to turn those moments into a film and say, you know, this is it's a dramatic retelling with a little bit of creative license of something that genuinely happened to me. Um, and I thought that, you know, people are interested in these types of stories and the fact that it's something that I went through and I am here to tell it and I've lived and I'm a survivor of the situation. Um, I thought that 
I not that I owe it to my fans, but that I owe it to myself to finally give that to myself to be able to be free and be open and not have to hold this weight and this dark secret inside. Um, and the secret being like all the little details of everything that went down. Yeah. Um, you were, when you were on the show last, you told your story about, uh, being manipulated into the industry. And it was the first time that you'd told the story publicly, which obviously must've been really hard to do. Were there any parts of the story that, um, you weren't ready to share yet that come out in this film? Yes. Um, pretty much all of it. I think (laughs) that definitely was the first time I had ever publicly spoken of it. I think I only was first told by somebody that it sounded like trafficking or what trafficking is in 2018, like Mm -hmm. early. So it, you know, it was taking me a while to fully grasp and understand what happened to me because I was in shock, I think still for years and just pushing it down um, because I needed to cope. I needed to find a way to like keep going and not just crumble into this, you know, pile of trauma Mm -hmm. I wanted to pursue porn and I knew I needed to be strong and just keep going on and pursue it um so I think when I was on the podcast last I gave like you know a basic idea I was manipulated I don't even know if I used the word trafficking at that time or maybe I did um in this film people are gonna see obviously with a little bit of give and take because it is a film and it is a pornographic film, mm-hmm. um, they're going to see what happened. They're going to see the feelings I went through, the emotions, the people that were a part of my life, the people that came and went, um, even seemingly irrelevant people I wanted to include in the story because that's my story. And, you know, um, I really, I took a lot of inspiration from Sean Baker, who's a filmmaker. He does mostly independent films. Um, and a lot of them feature sex workers or porn stars or just sex work as a narrative in general. Um, and they're usually nonlinear. They're very much like a series of moments that kind of happen and just bringing it together into a film and a lot of stuff open to interpretation. So I wanted to do a film like that. I didn't want it to be super rigid Um, with like, you know, the dates and the timing and the characters, the dialogue, I wanted it to kind of just be, um, my truth. Mm -hmm. So this film is my truth Mm -hmm. and people will finally get to see that. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea of girls getting trafficked into porn is a big one that is used often by anti-porn activists. Um, so how did you walk that line of creating this movie without making it come off as like anti-porn? Mm-hmm. Um, porn actually has very little to do with the entire film as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um, it's telling the story of the year of my life before I entered the porn industry. And only at the very, very end of the film is there even a glimpse of porn. Um the way that we shot that scene and the way we approached it was just in a very honest way. So I wanted people to just not think, oh my God, like this is so, porn is so amazing or porn is terrible. Like I just want them to see it and see this is what it really was. And, you know, I've stuck around and whether people want to believe this or think this, like porn saved my life. I had no direction in my life. I didn't know where I was going to go. I was just a traumatized young woman. Um, Porn gave somebody that was already a very sexually open person an opportunity to make something of myself and make a life for myself. Um, So I don't, I guess, you know, after someone would view this film and then, kind of see what I've been able to do after these events occurred and what I've been able to accomplish in my career and my life, I hope that they don't see porn as trafficking because for me, porn is the furthest thing from my experience of being trafficked. Porn was me having my own choices. And I made that decision for myself to fly down to Florida and start shooting. I had an agent that helped me book the scenes, but When I went to set, it was all me. And that was the opposite of my experience as a trafficking survivor. So I hope and I think that people will be able to see that in the film 
Um, but also, you know, I'm not here trying to change anyone's mind. Mm -hmm. I'm just, this is for people with an open mind yeah. that just want to, you know, see it for what it is. Well, I think it's actually like a healthy thing to be able to show that because there is this whole anti-trafficking movement that they're trying to use because, you know, porn is constantly being attacked. I've seen it my whole life. Mm -hmm. I've seen it with my parents. I've seen it with the Mies Commission. Like, you know, it's it's always been around. So the new angle is, is trafficking, right? The idea mm -hmm. that like all of these before it was the idea that porn was ruining the social fabric of like the family and, mm -hmm. and just society in general. And it was corrupting the world. Mm -hmm. Now it's like very specifically about unwilling women being forced to do porn. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of, I think it's good that you were able to make a film and distinguish between like, yeah, trafficking and porn because both things happen, right? Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, these anti-porn activists always want to make it all the same thing. Every girl in porn is trafficked. Mm -hmm. um, where your story seems to say, there's trafficking, I experienced it. It was a negative thing. Yes. There's porn. I experienced that and that was a positive thing for me and that is not the same thing. Yes. So how was it, how were you able to, I guess, go from this, you know, obviously traumatic experience of being trafficking, being trafficked into porn? Like, because I think most people would feel that, oh, once you were trafficked, then all the idea of the porn industry in general or moving forward in sex work in any way, mm -hmm. shape or form would be something that you wouldn't want to go through. You'd go the opposite way. So how did you make that? How was porn like still an option for you, I guess, is my question. The reason that porn was the option that I chose is, well, what I experienced in that year from October 2016 to about September 2017, um, I don't consider that to be sex work. I know that from the outside looking in and it seems like it would be. It seems like I was just any other cam girl online, webcamming, making money. But I had no control over anything that was happening. I couldn't control when I would get paid. I was told when to work. I was told what clothes to buy, how to dress, what to do. Um, and I was told if I didn't do those things that I would never be successful, that I would be a fucking loser um, and a failure. And I don't know if it's part of being Jewish or part of being a woman or if it's a family thing, but I, my, one of my biggest fears was being a failure and just feeling like a failure, feeling like I tried to do something and I was not able to succeed. Mm -hmm. So I was already in the adult industry or whatever you can call that. I was in the adult world and mm -hmm. doing that type of work for a year. And I had been told by my trafficker that porn was not an option for me. I would not be doing porn because porn is dirty and gross. And he he would um, up like kind of say that camming and webcamming was like the future and that porn was on its way down. Nobody even watches porn. Everyone's watching cam girls. And I knew close to nothing about the adult industry. So I believed everything he said. So I never saw porn as like, an option for me. I never made content during that year. It was just camming. So then when I got out of that situation and I started thinking about, you know, what do I want to do? Do I want to leave the adult industry or then I'll feel like a failure and then he'll be right. I'll, I couldn't do it. I couldn't handle it on my own or I couldn't figure something out, but I knew I didn't want to do web camming. It was like tainted tarnished for me. So I said, if I'm going to stay in adult, I'm going to have to do something else. And I'd been thinking about porn a little bit throughout the year, but obviously what had held me back was him and his opinion of it and just not feeling like I wasn't comfortable in my own skin to like appear in videos like that and sell them. Um, so after I left that situation, I started experimenting with like making videos of myself and different types of like solo content. And I wasn't happy with it. I wasn't happy with the way it looked, um, my camera quality, the lighting, my body, my face, like everything. I was just like, no, I don't not happy, but I think I want to do this. So how can I do this and be happy with the product that I'm seeing? And then it all just kind of clicked and it made sense. And I said, mainstream porn films like this is what I want to do I want to appear in movies or films I want people to know me I want to have sex on camera but 
in a way that's going to look really professional and good. And I said, the companies are the ones that can make that happen. I knew of Riley Reed, Adriana Chechik, and I said, I want a career like that. I want to be famous. Like if I'm going to pursue, you know, this endeavor now and stay an adult, I want to be extremely successful and never feel like, am I a failure? Like, and mm-hmm. never even have that thought cross my mind. And it's, it has, it's an internal thing. It's probably never going to go away. Um, but yeah, porn was just completely separate. It was something that I wanted to do, but never felt like I could. And then when I was free and I could do it, I decided to just dive into it. And I'm so glad that I did. Yeah. So what made you, so when did you want to actually turn this story into a movie and what was your decision to go with adult time? So it's been, um, we started talking seriously about this film stars. I started talking with Brie around like March, April. Um, but I had the idea to turn my experience into some type of art or some type of film a year ago, or maybe even more than a year ago, because previously I had a written a story for Pure Taboo, which they were on a kick of doing like a lot of model collaborations where you could write your own story. And a lot of people were taking like personal trauma that they had experienced and turning it into a Pure Taboo film and kind of seeing it as like an empowering thing. Like, you know, I'm taking back my story and yeah, turning it into such a cool and interesting dynamic. I know. And people would never think when you think about porn, you know, you don't think about empowering situations like that. But with adult time, that's all I've really seen and experienced. Um, so I had the idea at first, I never thought this would be like a feature film that didn't even cross my brain. I didn't think I was capable or allowed to do that or something, but I had the idea that it could be, you know, like a featurette and maybe I could just take one sliver or one particular part, the equivalent of like one scene from the feature and make that, um, a scene for Pure Taboo. So I talked to Brie about it and she was very into the idea and told me to think about it more and come up with something. So I had this idea um, and then I decided, no, I don't want to do it that way because if I'm going to tell my story, I want to completely tell my whole truth and not leave out all of those details. Like obviously you can't include every single detail, Mm -hmm. but there was a lot more stuff that needed to be included, I felt that it couldn't fit in like a 40 minute scene. So then it was an ambitious idea, but I had the idea to turn it into a feature after seeing, you know, Brie did a really successful film called Teenage Lesbian. That was her own biopic. And then last year they did the biopic on Casey Kisses for Adult Time. So I knew that Adult Time was supportive of um, performers turning their trauma and their life story into art to be consumed by the viewers. Um, So I felt comfortable and I knew in my heart that adult time was the only place that I was going to do this project if I was going to. And that, of course, Brie was going to be the person I do it with, of course. Um, And I just I was lucky and Brie was just totally into the idea and believed in me from the very first meeting. Um, And we were able to turn it into something fantastic. That's what I love about the adult industry today, because, you know, I've been around for a long time and I've seen a lot of changes. And it's just so cool that the adult industry is now a place where you can tell your own personal story and like work through your trauma in a porn film, which is something that like nobody ever imagined would ever happen. And for me, I know there's a lot of people who question you know, how could you work out trauma in a porn scene, especially if it was like a sexual trauma thing. But I've talked to quite a few girls who've done similar things. And from what I've come to understand, I think that trauma has a lot to do with feeling, um, having no control, like Mm -hmm. feeling, you know, this inability to control your situation and fear. Um, so I think taking that and then putting it into a situation where you have control, where you have agency and you can explore that without the fear, I think can be a really healing thing. And I don't know, I just think it's really cool. I completely agree. And uh, this experience was other than, you know, talking about it with 
you a little bit on the podcast um, three years ago. And then obviously in my private therapy and like my own healing, I go deeper into that. But this film has been the catalyst for that. Like I haven't even scratched the surface of the work that I need to do on myself in order to fully heal from the situation. And this film has been a huge first step, like a bigger first step than I ever could have envisioned. And I never have envisioned until now because it was always just, you know, something that happened to me. And I couldn't until I got a little bit older and a little bit further from the situation. When something only happened to you two years ago, you can't really even understand your own feelings about it, or I couldn't at least. So now that it's been six years and five years since the end of it, I'm finally starting to like unpack like that. Yeah, I was trafficked. Like I, I lost control. I didn't have control. I didn't have agency over my own self. And that situation, you know, was happened after a lot of other stuff happened in my life and it all just intertwines and it comes together into the person I am today. So I don't think I would change anything um, because then I don't know who I'd be. Yeah. And I don't like that. I, I like who I am now. I like everything I've learned and every bad thing I've been through has just been a lesson that I've learned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was most, cause this was the first time that you ever directed a movie, yes. right? So what was that like? Like what was the most challenging part of directing? And then what was the most rewarding part? Um, so I was so grateful because I went into this, you know, having written, obviously the film, it happened from my own life, my own brain. Um, and Brie helped with the writing, of course, but I did not go into this film thinking that I was the director or the co-director of this film. That was a, a title that was given to me after the fact by Brie that I'm so grateful for. Um, so that kind of looking back, there wasn't this like pressure on me where I think if I went into it knowing that I wrote it and I'm starring in it and it happened to me and oh I'm directing so now I need to like I just overthink things mm -hmm. a lot so I'm really glad that I didn't have that like added pressure of it's feeling an like intimidating title too it, it is yeah. especially on a huge film like that and just having all of these different titles attached to me for that um and it being my own story made it intimidating to say the least um but during the process like it was actually so much fun because Brie gave me a lot of creative freedom and in ways that I never had before. I knew that, of course, I was going to be the historian on set to give people a reference for their characters and the scene and what was happening during that scene and in my mind and how everyone should be, you know, acting. So I went into it not feeling that pressure and just being able to enjoy um, these new things that I never experienced before as part of directing. So I guess for me, the hardest part was probably having to give notes as far as like the way someone is like saying something or, or portraying the character um, because I don't want anyone to think that I'm like criticizing them or I'm very conscious of like how I'm coming across or how I'm being perceived so I didn't want anyone to think I'm like being mean to them or being controlling or any of that negative stuff. Um, and I would say the best part or the most fun part was probably starting to have like creative control over certain shots. And if I wanted something to be included in the film, they would try really hard to accommodate me and, and usually would be able to. Um, and just I had some ideas in my head about certain shots and the opening shot of the film was my idea, something that I came up with in my brain um, that nobody helped me with. And there were some parts where we were filming that where Brie and our cinematographer, Michael Vegas, they were kind of saying like, we get what you're saying, but like, oh, it's not going to like look the way you think. And if we're doing it like, like there was just some, some roadblocks, but I stayed very true to what I wanted in that moment. And I said, this is what I want, like whatever we need to do to make this particular shot happen, like let's do it. And I'm willing to do whatever I need to do because I want that to be included. Like that's important to me. 
And then when I watched the first, you know, rough draft of the film, that opening shot, I had chills on my body because I knew that that came from my heart and my mind. Nobody helped me with that. And it just looked so fucking good. <laughs> and I was like, wow, like it really hit me. Like, wow, I, I really contributed so much to this incredible film. I'm so proud of it. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of like all the work that went into it. And, and everybody did so good. Every single person that worked on it did their job exceptionally well. I couldn't have asked for anything better. Yeah. It's it's a lot of fun to see your work. Right like, now. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I know what you mean to see that work come to fruition and that that first edit is like, yeah, is a really cool thing to watch. Do you see yourself like maybe becoming interested in directing more? It depends. Um, it was obviously like a really unique experience to direct something that I wrote and I'm starring in and it's based on my experiences. So I had somewhere to reach from and to go from. I don't know about directing something that someone else wrote or even something that I wrote, but I don't know about directing on my own. Like there's a lot of factors that I would need to think about. Like, am I ready for this? Is this what I want? But I think if it was the right project and just the right people working with me, I think I would definitely be open to it, um, whether it's an adult film or a non-adult film. I really did enjoy it, um, but I think I work better with people. Like, so maybe if it was a, another collaborative effort, mm -hmm. like a co-director, I think yeah. I would be open to it for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it takes a while to get to the point where you feel experienced enough and confident enough to like fully take on the yeah. director's mantle because it's a lot. And also a too, lot. in this industry, <laughs> a director also like means a producer, yeah. like live producer, executive producer, story producer. Everything. It's like, it's not just, you don't just show up on set and yeah. like tell people what to do. It's so much yeah. more than that. So it's you a lot to, of hats. Like, work with the script that you're given mm -hmm. and there's usually not a lot of room for like changes or notes and stuff. What I liked about being director is that I had so much like creative freedom mm -hmm. to just kind of go in whatever direction I felt. And I was the one that told Brie, I want it to really like emanate, is emanate the right word? Like a Sean Baker film? I wanted to uh, emulate. Off, emulate. Thank emulate. you so much. Um, I wanted it to emulate that type of like independent film. And that was an important thing to me. So it could have, you know, if I hadn't had that, it could have gone in who knows what direction, who yeah. knows how it would have turned out. But I had a very specific idea and a vision. So I guess that is really what I enjoyed most about being director is that my vision was taken so seriously and was able to come to life. I don't know if I want to do it if I'm not able to feel that experience. I don't think I want to make someone else's vision come to life. I just want to keep making my own visions come to life. Yeah, well. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and there you've like hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just funny. It's also like hard to make your own because I've done all of it. You know, I've shot for Wicked where I had to write the script myself mm -hmm. and put it together myself and yeah. like direct it and edit it myself. And it was rewarding in some sense, but it was also so much work. Yeah. Um, so that was tough. Some, sometimes it's nice to just show up and like shoot somebody else's script, but then also too, when it's not your own, you're not right. as passionate about you're it. Not, yeah. It's not like for me, I don't think it would be as fulfilling, yeah. but I, I don't know. Cause I have nothing else to go by. I'm, yeah. I'm so lucky that my first directing experience was this project. Like mm -hmm. who could have thought of that or yeah. planned it that way? Yeah. What is one piece of advice you would have given to yourself back in 2019 when we last spoke? One piece of advice? Um, I would have said, and who's to say that my younger self would have even listened to this, don't focus so much on what other people are doing. And you're doing fine. Even if you feel like you could be doing this, you could be doing better, like you're doing amazing. Mm -hmm. And that's been something that's been so hard for me in this industry, especially with social media and everything. It's just constantly kind of being thrown in your face, what everyone else is doing, whether good or bad or whatever. And you take that into account, even if you are trying not to, it's like subconsciously, I can't help but compare myself to other people's journeys. And there's a lot of factors that go into like a personal journey or career. And I think I've just focused a lot on how can I emulate this person 
and not so much just being proud of myself or, or being proud of my own accomplishments or pursuing and thinking about what can I do to make myself happier mm -hmm. or to make my own career better that doesn't have to do with X, Y, Z person. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say just just hang on because things are going to get better. Well, life is ups and downs, but they will eventually be you'll be on like a higher level and just in every aspect of life um, and just focus on yourself because you're doing amazing, Speedy. That's what I would say. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. yeah, I can totally relate that like FOMO is, is scrolling through Instagram and seeing yeah, everything that everybody else is doing. You have to also consider too that everybody only ever puts like their best face forward on Instagram. Including myself. Well, yeah, including myself too. Yeah. Like for the most, like, there are some people that yeah. I generally don't talk about like the bad things that are Personal going on in my life stuff, usually yeah. sometimes. But um, but yeah, I know what you mean. I, I have to say like embarrassingly enough, even at, at my age, the only thing that took me out of that was having a kid. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing that made me go, I don't actually really care about winning right. an avian ward now. Like, eh. yeah, you know, but it took that. Like I couldn't even like talk my, you know, yeah. I couldn't grow as a person enough to, you know, have this kind of spiritual barrier around me where like, well, I don't care what growing. anyone else is doing. Like I'm doing great on my own. Well, it's, I mean, it's <laughs> nearly impossible. I yeah. think it's, you'd struggle to find someone that's completely, you know, focused on themselves and not, having any type of like input or hearing anyone else's voice. Um, but I think having a kid is just a huge part of growth. Like, I think if I'm ever to be a mother one day, I think that, you know, I can't imagine being the same as I was before. Cause yeah. it's just, I already think about it. And like, I do want to be a mother one day. And I already think about um, how, some of the things that matter so much now or they seem like they do are just going to be completely irrelevant one day. Yeah. Like as much as I love, um, you know, performing and competing for awards and the fun and the buzz of like award season and the recognition, I just know that there are things in life that are more important. And this year in particular, I hit a rock bottom in my life where I was, I realized like, I'm not okay. I need help. Um, so I got it. And ever since then, that was about three months ago. I kind of, uh, things are just in a different perspective for me. Like I still love this industry and I'm grateful for everything it's given me, but it's not my life. Mm -hmm. It's not my life. Um, it's not the only thing that matters in my life. And I know that there will be a day in the future when I'm not actively working in this industry anymore. And I'm still going to be happy. I'm still going to matter the work I've done is not going to be like obsolete or for nothing. I know that people will continue to enjoy it and I will continue to go on and pursue new things and figure out what is life about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely this year have finally calmed down a little bit. I feel like there's this giant balloon or this bubble that my whole career has kind of just been inflating and me just feeling like, oh my God, like, there's so much stuff in this bubble, like so much I'm holding inside and like stuff I just need to push down because I just need to focus on work and doing well and winning awards. And that balloon popped and now all that stuff is coming out. So I now I'm like in the process of collecting everything and figuring out what I'm going to do with it. But I think that that's so admirable. And that's part of the journey of life is that we all hit that I think we all get to a place at some point in our life where we're like, wow, I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is to do something about that. Right. It's the people who sit and stew in their misery and their not okayness yeah. and who don't like take active measures to get through that because we're all going to hit that at some point. So it's about like what you do with that, you know, and what you yeah. do to get through it. Yeah. And uh, I didn't want to feel that way anymore. I was like, you know, I there's nothing in my life that is so – terrible that I should be feeling this way. So why do I feel this way? And then I realized it wasn't because of anything in my life. It's because of me and my relationship with myself. So I've just been working on that for the past few months and it's completely changed everything, put so many things in perspective and filming stars was definitely that. And then, um, 
pursuing, I don't know how to word it or how to call it. I'm, I'm in recovery mm -hmm. for codependence. Okay. Um, so it's been three months of that and that and the film, they kind of like well, filming stars, it unpacked a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff came up. And that made me feel like I'm not okay. I need to deal with all this stuff that has made me who I am. And some of it is going to be really hard, but I need to deal with that if I want to feel happy in life at any point. Um, so those two things, it's, I don't want to call it like divine intervention, but the fact that I felt like I hit my rock bottom right around the time when we were filming the movie and all that stuff started coming and I was able to like, really just dive in and start realizing like what I went through and that I need to deal with it. It couldn't have happened at a better time. And and now I finally feel like things are getting better and I'm feeling really happy. Yeah. It's funny how the universe works, huh? Very funny. And I'm grateful. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of Patreon questions before we wrap it up. Um, so this one is less of a question, more of a comment, and I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, Larry says your hair is heavenly. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you do have lovely hair. Thank you. Um, and then Cameron asked, uh, how has your experience as a performer informed how you approach directing? Um, great question. I, when, well, of course, as I said, when I was having the experience of directing, I didn't have it with like my director's cap on. I didn't see myself in that way. So I wasn't thinking about how can I, you know, be the best director in the moment. I was just doing it. I was mm -hmm. doing what Brie asked of me, which is to give as much of myself as I could. Um, I will say I would never expect or ask anyone as a performer to do something that I wouldn't do myself or that I wouldn't be comfortable with. Um, and I, I know as a performer that there are certain types of scenes or just performing in general, we tend to like turn it up a little and it's not necessarily going to be accurate to what sex is like in real life for that person. Um, so in directing the notes that I gave to anybody that was performing a sex scene in the film, which there's only one sex scene that I'm not in having sex in, but I'm still there, but mm -hmm. just not in it. And I told the performers, um, not that any of you guys perform fake in general, but just whatever type of like moaning, dirty talk, porn star vibes that you usually bring to a scene that makes it, you know, a scene just that's not necessary. I really wanted everyone to just be as real and as normal, whatever that means, as possible and not approach it like, okay, we're performing a scene, we're acting. Like, I really just wanted it to be an independent film that has explicit sex scenes in it, but that doesn't mean that, you know, how in a musical, like high school musical, they're acting and it's all blah, blah, blah. And then, oh, now we have like a 10 minute musical number that has nothing to do with what just happened or and then it's the next scene and that has nothing to do with that. Like, no, I didn't want it to be that way. I wanted it to be every sex scene flows really well with the film. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was what I had in mind the most is just like, uh make sure the performers understand that like, I get you, I am you. Well, usually I am you. Um, and to just be yourself, like just be, be normal, be mm -hmm. cool. A little more authentic. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question is from Danny Hill. First of all, he says happy belated birthday Thank and you. happy belated birthday. Thank you. Um, I mean, you kind of already answered this question, so maybe if you have something to add to it, uh -huh. uh, how has your work relationship with adult time helped in your catharsis? Yeah, um, I do have something to add. I will say that adult time and Brie specifically, but adult time as a company has been the only company that has really made me feel extremely valued. I mean, of course, well, valued for who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. That's a better way to word it. Every other company that I've worked with has been great. Um, but I always know that they expect and want me to be Jane Wilde, like the nasty little spinner girl that mm -hmm. does anal and lots of dirty talk. And I love that. Like, I never want to act like I don't enjoy performing because I love it and everything I've done, I'm so proud of. 
but I'm I'm now in a place in my life and have been this past year where I want to give more of myself mm-hmm. and who I really am and show more of myself. And Adult Time is the only company that really was like, yeah, we want you for who you are and we accept you for who you are. And we want to tell your true story. Mm-hmm. Everything else, it's been, you know, I'm putting on my porn star hat, my persona, and it's not that different, but I definitely amp it up as Jane yeah. um, when when working. And in this film, I didn't amp anything up. I just was completely real and raw in myself. And that's because of adult time. I can't say if it was for any company, I can't say that it would have been the same result. Yeah. So I'm just eternally grateful to them. Yeah. Now they allowed you to show another side of you yeah. because we all have more than one side to us, right? Yeah. And people, I know that people want to know about it, even if, you know, there's always going to be the loud minority vo- voices that are like, no, porn stars are just dumb whores. Like, you guys just need to stay, you know, doing what you do best and suck dick. And then I know that there's going to be people that. <laughs> I just hear that all the time, which all is hilarious to me. Because then I also, I mean, just like, you know, with my YouTube channel, I have like 185,000 subscribers right now. So I'm just like, there's 185,000 people that are actually interested in what porn stars have to say because right. th- they're here. And there's many more Because you that. can't watch porn on my channel. Yeah, like porn exactly. Porn, you know it's what just mean? conversations yeah. with people who do porn. And I know even just from TikTok and like the po- the popularity of like the corn yeah. hashtag and the God. blue and the black and orange square that represents Pornhub. Like, I know that people are interested in porn more than just watching porn. For sure. Um, And I guess when this film comes out, we will just see how interested people are. Yeah. That will be the test. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Jane. Um, Really cool. By the way, I just want to say you really have grown so much as a person since I last talked to you. I'm I'm very impressed by you. And um, I'm very proud of you and congratulations for everything that you've done. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me back to talk about my life and and the film that I helped create. Um, I'm so excited for everyone to see it and I'm going to just keep doing what I do and continue growing and elevating not just my career, of course, but my myself, my consciousness. Um, And I'm grateful for the growth. Thank you so much, Holly. Of course. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Yes. My Instagram account is wildsexual underscore or Jane being wild. Uh, My Twitter is Jane Wild triple X. My YouTube is Jane Wild XO. And my Twitch, my newly started Twitch account Mm. where I'm streaming live, um, playing games and talking with my fans almost every day is also Jane Wild XO. So check out any of those. Fantastic. Thank you. And then, of course, you guys can find me on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. And um, if you're listening on the audio platform, I would very much appreciate it if you would rate the podcast five stars, leave me a review, be nice, unless like you really fucking hate the show. And then like, why bother to leave a review? Like, why waste your time? (laughs) Um, If you're watching this on YouTube, um, hit the like button, subscribe. I would really appreciate that. And of course, if you want to watch these interviews live streamed as they are happening and submit your questions like some of my members did for Jane, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us as always, and I will see you next week.